Welcome to another weekly US news update. This week I only have three topics because one of them is a little bit long. Um, the first one is I want to talk about DJI that's demonstrating remote ID in the real world. Uh, I want to talk about 50 mile corridor, a drone corridor that just opened up in uh, New York State. And finally, I want to talk about a first, another first. This is a first blind drone flight. So we'll talk about what that means in a minute. So let's get started. So the kind of the big topic this week is DJI that's demonstrating how remote ID could actually work. Now, remote ID is not a new concept. I've actually talked about it several weeks ago. Um, I even have a video that you can click right here to get more information about the difference between remote ID and ADSB, which is two different technology. And um, at this point, we're, we're gearing towards remote ID, but um, the reason why we haven't talked about this for a while is that we're still waiting for the FAA to set up standards for this remote ID thing. And that's been pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And I actually don't even know where the latest is, but um, it hasn't happened yet. With that being said, remote ID, for those of you that are not familiar, is a way to broadcast the user's information to somewhere, to entities that could be using it. And when I say entities, I say uh, controllers, for example, the FAA, and law enforcement. There's even some talk about having this available to the general public. Now, what's not clear at this point is the actual method of sending this information and sharing it with everybody out there. Now, Kitty Hawk has done a great job with a white paper. I'm gonna put a link down in here. Kitty Hawk is the provider of uh, one of the lens provider that provides approval to fly and controlled airspace, but they've uh, dug in and there's actually, the, the data is very well presented in here in that document. But there's essentially two different school of thoughts about how this could actually work. And one way is kind of the simplest way at this stage, but it has limitation, is by using LTE network, by using your cell phone that, that is already connected to the drone you have the information in your cell phone or in your account, and then that gets broadcasted via the internet to everybody else that needs access to it. So this is simple. The, the, the infrastructure is already in place for this kind of system. The downside is if you're not in an area that has coverage, which happens. I live out west where we have remote areas and there's a lot of remote areas where this is not gonna be feasible. Now, with that being said, this is kind of the system that DJI is trying to demonstrate here with their most recent demonstration. The other concept is a concept where there would be equipment installed on the ground, separate equipment, and the user would have to install something on their drone that would be broadcasting that information to a ground station, and that ground station would be uh, spreading the information to whoever needs it, whether it's the FAA or law enforcement or controllers or whatever it is. So. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the stoppage right here, the, the blockage at this stage is the fact that there is not really a standard. Everybody's trying to do their own thing. And so it needs to be standardized, it needs to be approved, and then everybody can move forward. Now, why is this important? It's important because um, remote ID has been the key for a long time to making what we call complex operations now, to making them not so complex and make, make, making them more routine operation. Once the FAA is comfortable with the fact that they know who is flying the drone that's in the area, then they would be willing to open up the airspace a little bit more. From what I understand, this is what the, the major blockage is at this point. Now, there's still a lot of questions that are unanswered at this stage. Is First off, um, should the information be available to airports only? Should it be available in airports, obviously, for traffic separation? When I say airports, I'm talking about controllers primarily. Should private citizens have access to the information? In this model that, FA, that DJI presented, uh, private citizens would have access to this information. Who would pay for the equipment if there is equipment needed? Also, what kind of information is going to be broadcasted to all these, uh, these people, including to private citizens? Now, uh, I'm not really big on sharing the information, quite frankly, with private citizens. I know people are saying that it's important. It would make people feel more comfortable about the drone. All I see is just more harassment on drone pilots that they really don't need at this stage. But that's my personal take on this. Um, the other question that's unanswered really is, should this be a mandatory system or should this be something that people can uh, just go and voluntarily join? 
There's been talk that I've seen online about the fact that if people join voluntarily, then they would have access to other areas that people that don't join would not have access to. So again, there's still a lot of questions up in the air. Uh, the other question that comes up is what about the bad guys? The bad guys are not gonna follow the rules. They're not gonna uh, follow remote ID. And um, this is put in place to basically make everything safer. So um, again, lots of information, lots of unknown. But I think it's pretty cool that DJI is uh, showing this technology. The way that they did it is basically they, they use the drone sending the information to the controller. The controller is connected to uh, a cell phone. The cell phone is connected to a network, sends that information to the network, and then that is being shared to everybody else that needs access to it. So. Um, I really want to know what you guys think about this. I think this is a great topic of conversation. Um, no right or wrong answer at this stage. I think um, it's, it's still in the making and um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens and really what is the end result of this kind of technology and is this going to mean more access to airspace for us or is this going to mean more restriction or is this going to mean really nothing different at this stage, just more oversight from the government looking at what drone operators are doing. So let me know what you think in the comment. I'd, I'd like to hear from that. Next topic I want to talk about is a, a corridor. It's a 50 mile drone corridor that was just established and opened up in New York state. Uh, you, you may have seen the title and for, for, for a while, everybody says New York. New York to me is New York, the city of New York. And, um, and I, I thought, well, that's really interesting, opening up the airspace in New York. That's something that's been really restricted for a long time, but it's in New York state. Uh, the goal of the project is to actually bring UAS technology to that region. And that region is uh, between uh, Mohawk Valley and Syracuse. And that's basically uh, between these two areas where they're building this corridor. And uh, the, the corridor is uh, a place where companies can actually test their UAS technology in a real setting. So if you wanted to find, for example, what we we're just talking about with the remote ID and test this in real life, then there's this corridor that's opened up specifically just for drones where they can go. Now, the region has also set aside $12.5 million to help pay for this thing they call the Tech Garden in Syracuse. And I think it's pretty cool. Um, it's, it would be an area for technology in general, just trying to attract uh, technological companies to this area and uh, build up on, on the, the drone uh, industry, which I think is, is really neat, something that's growing. And I'm glad that this uh, state is realizing that and uh, is kind of um, investing in that area. So. Uh, they said that there's been 1,800 jobs that were created in that region since 2012 just from the drone industry, from the UAS industry. So again, if you live in that area, let me know. Are you, have you heard more details about it? What does it look like? What do you think it's going to bring? What kind of companies do you think would be attracted by this? Uh, let me know in the comments. Last topic for today is a first. We hear a lot of first on this uh, new segment and the first blind drone flight. Now, what is a blind drone flight? It's a beyond line of sight drone flight that does not involve anyone, including a radar. So um, in the past, what we've seen is we've seen a lot of first beyond line of sight flights, but all of them were always using some kind of technology on the ground as a radar with a user checking behind the technology to make sure that everything was working correctly. In this case, Iris Automation, they completed the first beyond line of sight flight uh, that was using only a technology that, that, that detects and avoid objects or, or aircraft or any kind of uh, vehicle by its, on its own, by, by itself. So I think that's a big step forward. Um, it's, uh, it's a really intelligent, intelligent system that's going to basically see if there is an object and then take action to avoid it. Now they said in 95% of the, the scenarios that they tested, they found that the system would avoid whatever obstacle was in front of it, and the FAA was comfortable enough with 95%, so they gave it a go. And, uh, and now that's what they're basically doing. So um, in the past, they were using uh, radar systems on the ground, really expensive. The, the, the article I read said up to $50 million for that piece of equipment on the ground to uh, find other objects around and, um, and send that information to the drone to avoid it. So. I think it's pretty cool, cool technology that we're seeing. Um, the downside to it, obviously, no human really was involved in, in the flying in itself, uh, but a lot of humans involved in, in the technology 
uh, to get developed. So um, we'll see where this technology leads us. Uh, more automated flight obviously is going to happen in the future. Uh, a good thing, a bad thing, I don't know. Uh, not many jobs being created by automated flights, but uh, if companies want to multiply the number of flights, then that's more than likely the route that they're going to go. So let me know what you think, what you think this means for the industry in general. And um, this is it. This is all I have for you this week. I'm actually really excited. Just finished a, a new course, just finished editing it. It's being reviewed right now and it should go live uh, hopefully early next week when we have all the uh, marketing in place. Can't really tell you much more at this stage, but I'm gonna leave you with this little bit of footage right here uh, that we got from uh, shooting this course. So I will see you again next week and uh, fly safe this weekend.